Professor Daniel is a biologist by training with a bachelor degree from Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais, another state here in Brazil, and a PhD in immunology from Universidade de São Paulo. After that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at USP, and I don't know how to say that, but La, La Hoya Institute, oh, thanks. <laughs> I was afraid of saying some weird word. <laughs> And currently, Daniel uh, is a professor at the Rockefeller University and associated researcher at the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Uh, in his work, Daniel Musida studies the relationship between gut microbes, diet, and immunity, investigating the mechanisms and processes involved in the intestinal homeostasis and the consequences when such processes are compromised. In his lab, they seek to reveal how the intestine generates uh, protective responses against invading pathogens while absorbing microbe and food-derived beneficial molecules. So help me to welcome Professor Danielle. Obrigado, Flavia. Um, Okay, so everyone is here? Most people. So I know that you guys are already, um, how many non-Brazilians? Okay, and it's all South America? Okay. Uh, Latin America, okay. I know that uh, Carolina already asked you guys to introduce yourselves a little bit if you don't mind. I know that you already did that <laughs> several times, but uh, since I don't know, uh, just uh, quickly. Maybe start from there. Can I, can I start? She, she gave us only three words to present ah, okay. ourselves. So keep, keeping the tradition. <laughs> Adenilson, mathematics, biotechnology. Uh, do, you get, do you mind saying uh, which university? So uh, <laughs> I, I have an uh, undergraduate in mathematics from Federal Uni University of Ceará, a master in mathematics from the Paris Saclay University, and I'm finishing an undergraduate degree in biotechnology in Federal University of Ceará. Okay. Okay, so the three words. Okay. <laughs> Denise, uh, physics and epidemiology, and the universities, I'm from Argentina. So I'm from Instituto Balcero in Argentina, and right now I'm going to start a PhD here at IFT UNESP. Okay. It's okay, it's not too long, right? Okay. Uh, Christiana, applied mathematics, and I finished my undergrad in Fundação Getúlio Vargas, na Escola de Matemática Aplicada. Okay. I'm Sebastian, I'm from Universidad de Antioquia in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, I'm a biologist. Hi, my name is Amanda, I'm a Bivon Lab Club. And By University of São Paulo. Uh, São Paulo, São Paulo. No, São Paulo, São Paulo. Hi, I'm Tawani. I'm a oceanographer, and I finished my master last year. My name is João. Uh, I finished my master's in ecology in Universidade Federal do Mato Grosso do Sul. Hi, my name is Gislaine. I am a graduate in veterinarian by uh, Universidade Federal do Paraná, and currently I'm pursuing a master's in bioscience and biotechnology at Instituto Carlos Chagas, Fiocruz Paraná. Okay. Hello, my name is Maida. I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry. I'm finishing my master's in biochemistry, both at USP, São Paulo. Hi, I'm Thales. I have a, I'm finished my undergraduate in biomedical science. I am applying to a PhD position in Butantan Institute, and I study the interaction between snake venotoxins and pathogens such as toxoplasma. Hi, my name is David. I'm from Colombia. I'm a physicist and biomedical engineer, and I'm pursuing my master's degree in biomedical engineer at uh, Universidad de los Andes in Bogota, Colombia. Okay. Hi, my name is Erika. My main interests are in bioinformatics and systems biology. I have an undergrad in genomic sciences from um, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. Hi, my name is Amanda. 
I made my bachelor and my master's in ecology in the Federal University of Paraíba. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Julia. I'm a biology undergraduate student at the University of Campinas. Uh, I'm Brazilian and I'm also interested in ecology. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Nicole. I am also Brazilian. I am also an undergraduate student at the University of Campinas. Campinas. We study biology together. Okay. Hi, my name is Mateus. I finished my undergrad in physics at UFBA, and now I'm starting my master in physics also at UFRJ. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Thales. Uh, I graduated from uh, UFRJ in biology, and now I'm finishing my master's in botany at Unicamp. Okay. Uh, I am doing now a master's degree in mathematics at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, I'm Benjamin. I do um, theoretical biophysics and movement ecology. I got my undergrad in physics at the University of Sao Paulo in Sao Carlos, and now in my master's, I am here at IFT, and I'm a visit going to be a visitor at Princeton. <laughs> <laughs> Say my name. Kauye. <laughs> That's right. Hi, uh, my name is Ruth. I'm from Mexico. I studied um, a master in mathematics in UNAM. <laughs> oh, I'm interested in, ep in epidemiology. Hi, my name is Isabel. I'm an undergrad in biology from Universidade de Brasília, and I'm currently doing there also a master's in animal ecology and evolution. Okay. Uh, hi, my name is João. I'm a biomedical sciences student at UFRJ. Ah, Marcelo Bosa. Yes. Hi, I'm Julieta. I'm from Colombia. I finished my bachelor in physics from Universidad Nacional de Colombia in Bogota. Okay, last one. I'm Camila. I'm also from Colombia. I'm a biomedical engineer too, also from University of Los Andes, and I'm doing my master's on the same area. Okay, so um, Colombia is the second most common country, and then uh, Unicamp is the most common. <laughs> Maybe USP. USP São Carlos. Okay. So, yeah, okay, so um, we have, um, so Carolina presented the basic concepts in immunology. I, I saw her slides, so I know that it was very basic. Um, and the plan that we had was, so we have five classes. So she gives a basic immunology. I'm giving, uh, I'm gonna try to give uh, most of what I prepared here, which is a bit more advanced, but still uh, basic. And then tomorrow, um, either her or I will present sort of a little bit more research-based um, class, so a little bit more advanced uh, component, and then the respective more advanced. And we didn't define the fifth class, yes. And I, I was wondering if you guys have anything that you would like us to present. You don't need to say now, um, but you can say maybe on uh, Wednesday, uh, today, uh, on Thursday. For example, um, I am a part of the um, selection committee of PhD program in the US, so I can talk about that. Um, Carolina is a, just a junior faculty at Yale, and she can talk about the experience. So anything you guys may want, but we can also give classes, is that whatever you prefer. Um, I have many classes prepared, but I just, I know that maybe, it's, you know, if you cover the basic of immunology, it already gets too much. But you can tell us um, a little bit later what's your preference. If you guys reach a consensus, it's even better. Okay, so um, I'm gonna give a lecture that I actually, I prepared this lecture for some online stuff, so, but, so I never gave, but uh, I wanna see how much we can uh, go. 
but if you interrupt me, it's better. So if we don't reach the end, it's better for me. I, you know, I, I feel that the interaction is better than the uh, textbook content. So, um, all right. So what I would like to cover is this, but we may stop at the second line. That's okay. Um, and the reason that we are covering this, I hope it will be useful for you guys in different fields, ecology and uh, epidemiology or uh, bioinformatics, um, because these are, these are concepts of biology that I think can be applied in many uh, areas. Um, and I think this is a good contrast to what uh, Carolina just presented, because it's a very, uh, what she presented is a kind of host pathogen interaction view of immunology. And I started studying immunology exactly on the opposite side, uh, which Marcelo Boza is aware. <laughs> so I will present a little bit of when we talk about mucosal surfaces. And you know, you don't have to memorize any of that. It's just if you can think in a concept as can be applied to your own field, this uh, I think is interesting. Then I will present the immunity that is associated with the mucosal uh, tissues. And then the concept of resilience, which is kind of uh, somewhat recent in immunology. It's not, uh, it's not new in biology, but in immunology, it's sort of new, which incorporates both resistance. And I'm going to give here examples from my own lab uh, research. So I'm going to give examples of how we study resistance, uh, tolerance, uh, classical tolerance and a sort of new, new form of tolerance that uh, come from plant biologists called disease tolerance. So um, these will be all examples from the lab, uh, but we can stay just in a concept as well. Uh, so we remain here. So my lab studies gut immunology, intestine immunology, but uh, if you understand uh, the concept of mucosal tissues, uh, it will be applied if you study lung, if you study uh, genital tract, or uh, you know, other mucosal surface like the, the oral mucosal surface, the nasal, and so on. Basically, our surface of the body that has mucus, so mucosa, and epithelial layer. So that's the kind of what makes a mucosal surface. Um, the mucosal surfaces are very different from this, each tissue that you uh, look. For example, the gut, and that's what I'm going to focus. It's a very interesting uh, type of mucosal tissue because it's a single layer of cell that is separating what is outside of the body from what is inside. It's a single layer. It's very different than other, uh, what they call type 2 uh, epithelial surfaces that have stratified several layers of cells. Uh, for example, the skin, even though it's not a classical mucosal surface, it has a stratified layer. Well, the difference that this makes is that uh, for the immune system perspective, uh, antigen that is outside here has to cross a lot of layers of cells like the skin to reach the, the body, as opposed to the intestine and the lungs as well. That's a single layer of epithelial cells separating, which makes very vulnerable or you know, interactive uh, area. Vulnerable in the sense of classical view that we are an army defending against invaders. But that's not how I learned uh, immunology. But that's a contrast. So why the mucosal surfaces are interesting, and that's kind of uh, my own story. So I actually started studying gut since my undergrad, since bef you know, younger than you guys. Uh, and I never left because I indeed is interesting. These days, I think you guys know most of what I'm going to present here. In the perspective of immune system, so the immune system, it's kind of a conjunction of cells of the body that are interacting with both self components and non self components. What we learn is that we have to defend against what is non self like what you learned this morning with Carolina, you know, viruses and pathogenic bacteria. Um, however, um, there are two aspects here that kind of contradict this view. It's not that the views are contra it's just not a very useful, use, uh, usual way of, of learning this. But one is that the area of exposure 
uh, of the intestine is very, la very large. So if you take the intestinal surface, as you guys know in humans, is about uh, 11 meters, the intestinal length. And if you open, cut open the intestine, open the area of the intestine, if you count the villi, which I'm going to show some examples, and the microvilli, it's about 300 square meters. So that's a tennis court size of a single human. So it's a mass, massive area that's exposed to non-self. It's exposed to non-self. Uh, so you would imagine that if you have an area like that exposed to non-self, which is microbiota and diet, that it has to be an area that is the army of the immune system has to protect very well. However, uh, the non-self interactions, so the self-non-self, -self, I think Carolina explained a bit, self-non-self -self discrimination, right? Uh, here is a bit different because most of the non-self are actually not pathogens. They are commensals and they are dietary proteins that you are eating every day, I, we just ate. Um, here is a two, two important concepts here. If you mount an immune response uh, against commensals and dietary protein, you are in trouble, certainly, right? And yet, these are the majority of the interactions in the immune system. So um, pathogens are very rare, you know. In immunology in the 90s, 80s, and before, people used to study uh, mostly uh, after you inject, like is for studies of vaccines, you inject something in the animal and see what happens in immunization. Uh, Butantan, someone from Butantan, right? You inject a venom, and then you see the anti-venom um, uh, serum generation. In fact, I think she talked about serum reaction, right? Um, however, we are not all the time injecting by venom or by IP of, you know, the most common thing that we are doing in a daily basis is interacting with bacteria that is not from us and with dietary proteins. This number is very interesting for people interested in numbers. This is um, 10 to the 13, so that's uh, 10 trillion. It's about 10 trillion. The number of cells we have is 10 trillion, roughly. That means every time you go to the restroom, you become more human than bacteria. In theory, in theory, because it's very close. So, but that is actually the paper that we visit this. Uh, that's what they actually said. <laughs> Um, and this is, uh, in terms of genes and uh, uh, gene pathways, is much more, is much broader than, and the other thing that's not studied very well yet, it's the virus of bacteria, bacteriophages, that are also very common in the gut. So, you know, against this type of interactions, we cannot develop uh, an inflammatory response, otherwise you develop a chronic inflammatory diseases like uh, inflammatory bowel disease and colitis, uh, Crohn disease, or you develop celiac disease. Some people here may have celiac disease, or food allergies. The same. If you inject, if you're mounting an inflammatory response against this type of non-self, it's not what you should do. And of course, you have pathogens, which is uh, the usual uh, what we learn uh, in textbooks. Okay. In terms of microbiota, I'm not gonna go into much detail unless someone is interested, but uh, the diversity of microbiota is pretty large, uh, particularly in the large intestine. But you have microbiota in the skin a lot. You have microbiota in the lung. It's not very well defined because it's very difficult to kind of assess in the lung without in, uh, inducing contamination. And the genital tract in the oral cavity and esophagus. Um, in the in the large intestine, you have about 200 species. That's the number of species of bacteria, each person. But the number of species available of bacteria in the gut is about 1,200 described, which means if you compare your bacteria from mine, it's going to be very different, the number of species. And you also, you also have strains. For example, each species may have 100 strains, which are sort of subspecies by genetic drift that they have after being a host for a long time. Um, and you, and the, the bacteria are not only different, they are also different, they have different functions. And there is a lot of functions described by the gut microbiota. These are uh, some of the disease processes that recent 
uh, 10, 20 years of work has uh, associated with the change in the gut microbiota. Uh, some are very obvious, like uh, appetite disorders or uh, inflammatory bowel disease in the gut. Some are very unusual. And if we have time, I'm going to show a little bit of the work in the lab in what people call uh, the gut-brain connection. For example, how can the microbiota influence uh, Parkinson's disease, Alzheimer's, neurodegenerative disorders, multiple sclerosis, anxiety, depression, and so on? How can the microbiota that's located in the gut uh, influence processes in the brain? That's a, a big area of investigation, yeah. This uh, microbiota uh, diversity across different persons, it's uh, regulated by genetic things or has another type of regulation because I don't think we have this diversity in a genetic level, you know, but uh -huh. that is... In so a, a big source of diversity is diet. So, okay. for example, uh, they, they are, there's a researcher from NYU, Maria Leptin, she goes to isolated tribes in the Amazon that has, have never, well, before she went, have never <laughs> get in touch with the, uh, you know, outside civilization. And then uh, the, the type of microbiota they have is completely different. So processed food, uh, content of protein, content of carbohydrate, lipid, all this will influence uh, the diet. Uh, if you, in addition to other stuff, for example, if you take uh, genetic identical animals, inbred strains, right? And then you go to one cage versus another cage, in general, it's different. Uh, it's not identical. Even though they're same, they're gen genetic identical. So, for example, the, where the light comes in, you know, that will influence stress levels and whatever. So there's a lot of factors that will influence the diversity of microbiome. I would say the main one is not genetic, but uh, uh, diet. Maybe you guys can uh, ask without the microphone to be, ah, someone is listening, okay. Then microphone. With, with Joel's question, how much of these gut microbiota is inherited vertically from our moms? Is what? Inherited vertically from our moms. Uh, a lot. So, well, from, you know, depends on the, uh, mice are coprophiles, so they eat the poop of each other. So in that case, it's huge vertical transmission. Uh, in humans, it's a lot. For example, there is a lot of uh, hospitals around the world that now, they, uh, if they do a C-section, they kind of uh, swab the newborn with the vaginal uh, channel microbiota to kind of accelerate the colonization of the newborn. So the, one of the kind of advantages of the natural birth is exactly the transmission of microbiota that could be protective in skin and so on for the newborn. But in humans, uh, the gut microbiota is a bit less, a, a lot less transmissible because you don't eat the poop of, you know, your mom. And uh, you are you drinking milk primarily, uh, and then it's going to be a lot of lactobacillus. Uh, initially, very low colonization early on, and then when you start eating solid food, Again, the question of the micro, when you start eating solid food, it changed com completely the microbiota. So after breastfeeding to solid food is a big change of microbiota. So it will depend on the species that you are studying. Um, and then some are also additional obvious, like liver disease, the liver is connected to the gut. Uh, there's a lot of cardiovascular disease, metabolism. So there's a lot of influence of the gut microbiota in metabolism. Uh, that's also a big area of study. And then there is kind of local in the intestine itself. So, but these are all kind of uh, somewhat distal. So the, how can they, the microbiota in the gut influence so many processes of the body outside? Anyway, so for the people in ecology, uh, there is a huge, in fact, one of the guys that is the main uh, you know, people studying that is that Rockefeller is the Sean Brady. It's the study of the diversity of the soil microbiome is amazing. Uh, so it's, it's, you know, most of the antibiotics were found uh, in, in studying soil microbiome, but the diversity in the gram of soil, and if a soil is from Arizona versus Bahia versus Amazon, is also completely different. A number of species is really uh, amazing. So 
This is true in other environments as well. Um, so we have huge area of contact with uh, non-self. We have, uh, we have um, huge amount of stimulation coming from the diet and microbiota. And we also have the largest uh, mucosal tissue in the body, the one that's associated with the intestine. So uh, there are subdivisions in immunology that you saw when Carolina presented, but you have uh, more T B cells and antibodies in the gut alone than what you have anywhere in, in the body. So it's a very huge concentration of uh, immune cells in the gut. Yet, they are not causing constant inflammation. There is a, what they call physiological inflammation, which is the steady state level of inflammation in the gut. But um, these are not causing pathological inflammatory reactions. Otherwise, again, you would stop absorbing nutrients, right? You would have invasion of the bacteria, then you have uh, in the, you know, in the toxic uh, shock and so on. So that is a um, very interesting set of immune responses that are induced and modulated in the gut that it's part of why this is a huge area of investigation now. Um, this I just said, and uh, here goes to the mechanism of immune resiliency, which I'm going to uh, talk about uh, very soon. So every, every single uh, mucosal tissue have their own uh, mucosal-associated immune uh, tissue. Um, in the, here is the second largest one in the respiratory tract, which they call uh, BALT or NALT, not nasal-associated or, or uh, bronchi-associated. Um, lymphoid tissue, and then you have the gut, which is the largest, then you have genital tract, which is also very interesting. Different types of antibodies uh, and immune cells present, salivary gland, and so on. All these have their own set of immune cells and immune responses, including the, the which is a new area of study. The mammary gland actually has a lot of antibodies. For example, when breastfeeding, there's a lot of IgA being secreted. People found very recently that uh, there's IgA that is uh, I'm not going to talk about IgA, a type of antibody produced in the gut. The cells, the B cells that are secreting, I'm going to talk about that, they migrate from the intestine to the mammary gland. So that's how uh, vertical uh, transmission can regulate the composition of the uh, microbiota in the newborn. It's via, via this uh, regulation of uh, B cells that are producing antibodies. So, you know, there's stuff to be studied in all these areas here, and it's a, it's a big field of study. So uh, what I was saying in the beginning is that uh, with Carolina, you, she was focusing mostly on this area here, right? You have pathogens, and that is true in, for people in ecology. And what we learn is that the immune system is mostly providing uh, resistance. Resistance in a sense of uh, eliminating the pathogen, just reducing the pathogen load. And I just mentioned that the largest immune system that we have is actually in the intestine. It's not in a circulation or in a spleen. It's in the gut. And in the, in the gut, you don't need to develop uh, resistance because if you develop resistance against these antigens, you cause disease. So here you need to develop tolerance. So I always make this uh, before, you know, Trump was a Trump in the US and uh, Bolsonaro. So I used to make an analogy here. You imagine that we are the Bolsonaro supporters. They are all thinking that uh, Brazil is trying to protect against immigrants. The immigrants are causing damage. But in fact, 99.9999% of immigrants are actually causing benefits to the country, uh, not damage. And then what, what the gut develops is tolerance, not resistance. And that's the most common immune response is tolerance. Luckily, he's gone soon. Uh, additionally, the development of immune response itself also can cause damage. And that's another form of damage, is the inflammatory response. For example, Carolina talked about uh, coronavirus already, probably not much, right? So in the next class. So the pandemic 
is exactly this, right? It's not the SARS-2 that is causing damage, but rather the immune response, which is what she studied. Uh, in fact, she's one of the first to describe that. Uh, it's causing an inflammatory uh, storm, cytokine storm, and uh, uh, secretion of a multitude of immune response that are causing damage in the, in the vasculature and so on in, in several places. That is the um, COVID-19 uh, disease. In any case, so in the lab, we are studying, and, and that's uh, I'm going to give examples of, uh, because I'm in this field for so long, I can give a class of the field and give examples of the lab, what the lab has been doing. Basically, how you develop tolerance against your own immune response, that's towards the end or in the next class. Um, the development of resistance and also the development of tolerance uh, against uh, diet and, and microbiota. Okay. Do you guys have more questions about this initial uh, interface, resistance and tolerance? Okay, so this is a very interesting review. I recommend for those interested uh, in different fields, I think is interesting. Jan Janela Ari is a, is a researcher from the Salk Institute. And she does a lot of, um, she writes a lot about this kind of conceptual uh, frameworks. Uh, uh, more, than she <laughs> more than she does research itself, but it's very interesting uh, what uh, she writes. And she writes together with uh, another, uh, in the beginning of this kind of field, they, uh, my, actually Marcelo Bosa was involved, and then you have um, Ruslan Medzitov at Yale uh, working, uh, studying, studying this. Basically, this is steady state, right? So here is uh, the level of, of disease versus health. Right, so steady state you have, of course, this is in a given age. Age is another fact that will influence the vigor, what they call that vigor. Uh, insult, normally in the immunology we consider insult uh, a pathogen. Of course, each field will have different type of insult, and in ecology, of course, you have similar type of balance here. Uh, insult will disrupt the system or the organism from uh, steady state, from homeostasis, right? Uh, and the pathogen uh, will come and will induce damage. There are some pathogens that induce damage directly. They lyse the cells and so on. And some pathogens that induce immune response, SARS-CoV-2, that induce damage. Regardless, this insult is taking the host out of uh, the maximal health, going to disease process. Uh, and this moment here uh, is where you have sort of uh, uh, resistance kicking in. So if the resistance is uncontrolled, then in general, you're going to have tissue damage, and then you, know, you can get sick. But in general, there is a balance between the resistance that will control the number of pathogens, in the case of pathogens as an insult, and then you develop tolerance uh, to this pathogen or to the immune response that was induced by the pathogen. And then this creates this level of resilience, which is the return to the homeostasis. So tolerance is just part of the pathway to return to homeostasis. The resilience is incorporate tolerance and recovery and repair. There is also damage that can be caused by recovery and repair. For example, excessive repair, fibrosis, can also cause damage. So that is also you can return to lower level of health as well in this process here. But this concept here is a very important concept when you are thinking about immunology because it incorporates every aspect of the immunology. And you guys in the different fields may have, uh, I think, parallels uh, when you study your own field in terms of uh, insult, perturbation, cause disruption of the system. Then the system can continue in this process and it loses homeostasis or can return to homeostasis via this process. So um, I'm going to give a few examples of uh, resistance uh, in the way that we study in the lab and uh, just as examples of uh, also the form of resistance that we have. And, but first, uh, a few concepts like textbook con concepts of classical resistance, which I'm going to go a little bit faster because I know that she already talked about that. But what I'm going to try to do here is to 
make a parallel to the classical resistance and the one that you have, you have in the mucosal tissues. OK. This is actually Ruslan's slide. OK, so um, in general, when we have a respiratory infection or systemic infection, you have pathogens. They invade the cell. You have destruction of the pathogen or and elimination of the inf infected cells. That's the normal, the normal consequence of resistance uh, as long as it doesn't go to the sick uh, stage that I was talking about. But as I was just presenting, uh, a lot of what our immune system is doing is not dealing with pathogens, but dealing with daily stuff, food, noxious substances, macroparasites, and so on. And this type of, um, of uh, insults are, should not be dealt in the same way, actually, than uh, what you have, uh, the elimination of cells and so on. So the type of Im immune response that is induced by this type of, um, of insults that are very common in the mucosal surfaces, for example, parasites, right? noxious substances, you eat a poisoned food, and so on. This is very common in the intestine. So the type of immune response that is triggered there is very different than the one that is triggered by a respiratory uh, pathogen. So here, the strategy is not to destruct, destruct the, the it's very difficult to destruct a uh, parasite. You normally have to eliminate from the system. And it's very difficult to eliminate cells because it's not the cells the problem uh, if, you have, if you're dealing with a venom of a noxious substance. So in this case, you have to eliminate uh, or not absorb the noxious substance. So the strategy is very different. And I'm not going to go into too much details of this strategy, but I'm going to give some examples here. Um, this is how the mucosal barrier, in general, are uh, organized. So if it's a mucosal, it has mucus. And mucus is, is, is this you know, thick, sometimes very thick layer uh, of, of uh, stuff that includes carbohydrates, lipids, and so on, uh, that form a layer that is sort of protective from the, from the lumen, or in the lung, or gut lumen, that serves as a physical barrier uh, for complementing the presence of the single cell layer that you have in the intestine, for example, or in the lung. But this also, it's very important as a communication to the, to the bacteria, for example. There's a bacteria, there are a lot of bacteria in our intestine that is feeding on mucus, that depend on mucus to survive, so they are attached to the mucus layer. So this doesn't mean really a wall that is protecting us. It's really something that interacts with the pathogen. And in the case of the lung and in the case of the intestine, the type of antibodies that you have in this layer is very different than the antibodies that Carolina was talking about, or she's going to talk tomorrow. Antibodies that are eliminating the pathogen. What we have here is this type of antibody called IgA. And IgA interacts very different to the pathogen than you have IgGs and IgMs that you have in the circulation. Um, and I'm going to explain how IgA is formed in the coming slides. Do you guys have any questions? Um, is um, too tense or is basic enough? I have just one simple question. What is the difference between resistance and resilience? So resistance is just a process of controlling the pathogen load. Resilience is a process that involves a tolerance and repair that after insult, you restore to homeostasis. So it may not have anything to do with resistance, actually. But it, it could be, because a resistance may involve elimination of a pathogen, and then this is the beginning of uh, the return to homeostasis. Yeah. OK. So this, you guys know, I know that you have had classes of immunology before, most of you. Uh, but anyway, uh, an antibody that's produced by B cells, by plasma cells, a form of B cells. And normally, we learn about the function of antibodies in the classical view. For example, the antibody has the two segments. Uh, Angelina, uh, Carolina presented this, right? The FAB and FC, right? Uh, the FAB is binding pathogens. And the function of the antibody is normally determined by the FC, by the constant uh, part. 
uh, a lot of history on that, actually. Most of this discovered at Rockefeller, so it's very interesting in, uh, at the university, this, uh, this, this structure. For example, the different uh, cells that, are, that have the FC receptors that bind the constant part of the antibody, they will, form, they will perform different functions. They can kill the uninfected, uninfected cell, they can do opsonization of the pathogen, and they can neutralize. That's also part of antiviral response, uh, neutralization of the insult. Um, and these are the additional part that involves uh, complement activation, another form of kind of dealing with a pathogen. All this, not, none of this is common in the mucosal surface, actually. This is all uh, found in the periphery, in the circulation, the blood, and so on. In the circulation, uh, in the mucosal surface, you have instead a different kind of antibody, IgA. And IgA does completely different things to the pathogen. In fact, it's not very, very well described what it does. But um, a postdoc that's in my lab, for example, found that, uh, that the two papers in his PhD thesis, he found that IgA can help a particular strain of bacteria to colonize. So, it's a called a founder effect. I think in the ecology you have founder effect. If you have in a species of bacteria, different strains, uh, he tested what IgA is doing to that. And he found that IgA is what allows the founder strain of the same species, strain A versus strain B, to attach to the gut and form colony uh, uh, biofilm, sort of biofilm formation. And this prevents the second strain to control. You normally don't have three strains of the same species in the same individual, and IgA is doing that. So that's completely opposite of eliminating the pathogen. In this, in this example, is helping the pathogen to colonize. I'm sorry, not the pathogen, helping the microbe to colonize. Obviously, that's not a, a pathogen. It's a, a non-pathogenic microbe. And we produce grams of this every day grams of IgA, which is more than what we have in IgGs already in the blood. So it's a huge amount of IgA. And this IgA, this is an example I gave, it's helping the host ourselves or mammals to kind of interact with the, with the microbes that is in our gut. It, it mediates the interaction as the example I just gave. In some cases, it may prevent the pathogen of attaching to the epithelium, but allowing the pathogen to survive in the mucous layer. So it's an uh, array of functions that IgA has that is different than eliminating the pathogen. Yeah. Can you explain again, very briefly, uh, uh, how the, those, the IgA helps the pathogen to interact with the... I can give the study if you guys want later, but um, in, in this case, what happens is that, uh, in, in this example I give, and it's not all, right? Uh, when the IgA bound in the bacteria, allows another bacteria to bind and creates a kind of a, a, an initial cluster of bacteria. Uh, and this depends on the IgA binding. Uh, and then once the bacteria creates this cluster of proliferating cells, it forms sort of a biofilm. It's not exactly biofilm. It's kind of disputed whether you can use biofilm in the gut, but it's a biofilm, and this prevents the other bacteria to do the same because the IgA already is bound to this initial bacteria. But yeah, I can give, if you're interested, I can give the study. Okay, so how is, how this uh, process here is occurring? So that's, uh, again, we're gonna go back to a little bit of what Carolina presented. How can, uh, you know, you have an animal that never saw a bacteria, commensal bacteria, for example. How can, after a few weeks, you have formation of secreted IgA in the gut? How is this process occurring? Basically involves a series of steps that I'm not gonna get too much in details unless you guys ask, because that's very deep immunology, and I don't think that's the point of, the, of this course, for what I understand. But basically involves interaction of multiple types of immune cells that I think you're gonna hear multiple times <laughs> in the coming days. But you have a T cell that interacts with an antigen presenting cell. This antigen presenting cell is presenting the bacteria antigens, activating the T cells. Some of these T cells 
differentiating what they call follicular helper cells, TFH. You don't need to memorize, just to understand the concept. These T cells migrate to where the naive B cells are. Uh, my colleague at Rockefeller, Gabriel Victoria, stu studies exactly that. This process here is a beautiful process. Uh, this is a pli pious patch, but that's sort of a lymph node that you have in the gut. A lymph node is where the initiation of the immune responses to a new pathogen is initiated, or a pathogen or whatever you initiate. Uh, so the T cells interact with the B cells, and you form this process called germinal centers. Uh, this is an amazing process um, because uh, it's an interaction of B and T cell, and there is a constant, is accelerated natural selection because you have the T cells that are selecting the highest affinity B cells. The B cells start mutating, really Lamarckian type of, of evolution. They mutate, and then they proliferate, they go back to where the T cells are. The T cells continue selecting, and that's a process of affinity maturation. So you have a higher affinity B cells being selected in, a, in questions of days, a, a huge amount of mutation. And then you have a, a bit higher affinity uh, IgA cells. These cells are, are then mature. They can turn into plasma cells, and then they secrete antibodies. So how does the antigen that is in the lumen reaches the site that it should reach to initiate an immune response. So the main, uh, the main way that we study in textbook is via uh, the draining of the lymphatics. So if you immunize, like you guys immunize coronavirus, or most of you <laughs> immunize against coronavirus, then you have, well, some people are you know, against. So you immunize, then you have uh, draining to the draining lymphatics. And that's why, kind of below your armpit, you have this swollen lymph node. That's draining of the antigen as well as of these dendritic cells that are specialized antigen-presenting cells that are migrating with the antigen and with the virus particle, so on, to the lymph node. So that's a kind of a way that this is drained. In the gut, it's slightly different, but it occurs as well. Via the epithelial cells, you have transport of antigens that can reach the lymphatics and reach the drain lymph node. Yeah, my question was actually about it because like considering this, this dynamics of the IgA helping the microbe to, to you know, proliferate or to attach to the, to the gut, yeah. uh, and considering that the, the, the Ig formation is a random process, so then uh, the, the regulation of the microbiome cannot be ruled by this, because if not, you can just help every niche uh, 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 well, it, it's the So the, the question is, how can the random formation of antibody uh, regulate a specific microbe? Yeah, actually, the question is if this is exactly true, the, the innate immunity and this presenting of the yeah. antigen. That's then, right. The innate rule it and yes. just present what we need to see. Yes. Okay. That's how it is initiated. Although there are multiple ways, which I'm not going to cover here, but this here is uh, describing an antigen presenting cell that can initiate, so innate immunity okay. to start. Uh, but in the gut, there are additional ways of, of capturing the antigen and bringing to the, to the specific place to the, to the, where the initiation of immune response takes place. So, you have uh, M cells. These M cells are kind of uh, modified enterocytes in the intestine, and they are sitting on top of these structures, pious patches. So this cell, is a, this is not a, uh, exactly a perfect uh, illustration, but you have antigens in the lumen, and these antigens can reach the inside of the body through the cells that kind of have a little bit of holes here. It can pass through these cells and then reach what you ask in the antigen presenting cell in the underneath uh, surface. So that's transport via the M cells. Uh, again, this is examples of how the antigens can reach uh, the body. Um, in the end, these processes are taking place in the draining lymph nodes or in, the, in these structures in the intestine called pious patches, and then you have maturation of antibodies, formation of antibodies, and then the tr antibody is trans transported towards the lumen. How is the antibody, antibody transport? So that's the only place that this happens, actually. How can you have antibody in the luminal site as 
if you think that the immune cell producing is underneath the luminal side. So you have this uh, transport system that the epithelial cells in the basolateral side, the side of the body, have uh, transporters, uh, receptors that, are, you know, that can bind to the IgA that's produced in the body, and then through the epithelial cell, they can release this in the luminal side. So that's a way of distinguishing antibody that's IgA secreted because it has the secretory component, which is derived from the transport mechanism that brings these antibodies uh, to outside. Uh, very interesting amount of uh, work done with this IgA specific to coronavirus, for example. Uh, that's how the initial found that uh, these coronaviruses can survive in intestinal tissue, in the, in the epithelial cells, because they saw a lot of IgA specific to the coronavirus. Okay, so um, very briefly, again, no need to memorize any of that, but the type, what I was presenting here, um, if a pathogen is inducing, is proliferating within the cells, you need to kill the cells or eliminate the pathogen versus a pathogen that is in the mucosal surface that the expulsion of the pathogen is the kind of only way. Sometimes they actually don't expel, right? There are parasite, uh, helminths that survive with us without causing damage for a long time. So these are very different types of immune response that are induced if you want to do this versus if you want to do this. Actually, the people in the Zoom don't know what is this and this. So to accommodate for that, the immune system has subtypes of T cells that uh, Carolina probably mentioned some, and I'm not going to go into these details, but the way that T cells can differentiate will be matched to what function the immune response is leading to. For example, um, TH1 are important for controlling, for example, intracellular bacteria. Uh, the, we will induce a, a type of ad, a adaptive immunity, antibodies, type of antibodies, specific types of IgG, for example, and types of activation of macrophages, like activation of other immune cells that are important for ex, uh, intracellular bacteria. These are extracellular bacteria. TH2 are warm. So TH2 is a very interesting, and I'm, again, no need to memorize TH2, but this type of immune response called type 2 immunity, that's the one that is induced in response to, to helminths and parasites. It's also the one that we have, and we have allergic responses. So Rosna Medzitov, who is here, this guy here, um, proposed that allergic response is not like a, a byproduct of an incorrect reaction against uh, pollen or against uh, you know, uh, shrimp or peanuts that you have allergy but rather an evolutionary selected uh, mechanism to deal with noxious substances, uh, including parasites. So what a type 2 immunity does, and is very common steady uh, response in the intestine, is to expel. For example, you, when you have a helminth infection, you induce a type 2 immunity, Th2, that is modulated by th uh, Th2 cells, that will induce a set of downstream mechanisms that are involved with ex expelling the parasite. Uh, also, for example, if you have a bee venom or a venom, that is also the way to get rid of the venom. It's via type 2 immunity. So mast cells that release histamines, um, eosinophils, basophils, other types of innate immune cells are mediating exactly this sort of more uh, you know, steady state response to the intestine. What is interesting here is that this response type 2, because it's the most common in mucosal surface, is also the one that is involved with the repair tissue, tissue repair. So this is a kind of a classical example of uh, resistance that is involved in the tolerance process as well. So type 2 immunity, it's kind of naturally a repair type of immunity. And not surprising, is the one that's very common in the mucosal surface. So when we learn that allergy is an off target, of course it's an off target, but it's not something that appeared uh, you know, by mistake in evolution. Very likely is involved in this uh, process of dealing with stuff that you don't you want to get rid of. 
you also have this form of T cells here that was ignored for many years in immunology. And that's the most common form of T cells that you have in, in steady state intestine, which is a regulatory T cell. So that is a T cell that is not inducing an inflammatory response, but rather it's controlling an inflammatory response. So that's why it's called regulatory T cell. This is the same cell that's involved um, in the regulation of uh, uh, self-reactive uh, T cells. So what is called central tolerance, how you develop a tolerance to your own body, right? So these cells are essential for the process of central tolerance, but they also are essential in the process of peripheral uh, tolerance. You guys have three classes today, right? That's a lot. So I, I may uh, end early so you can have a break. Um, okay, so I mentioned how the B cells are formed. I mentioned a little bit of how T cells get activated. Um, however, there is something that we also ignored for a long time, is that T cells can also reside and live within the tissues. So T cells are not only in the lymph nodes and the spleen and so on. There's a huge amount of cells that are living in the brain, for example, which is, used to be thought as an immune privilege, but is not true. There's a lot of immune cells in the brain, lungs, liver, and so on. So you have these cells that are surviving within the tissue, and these are called uh, tissue resident uh, memory cells. Very interesting cell to, to study. These are not cells that are circulating in the blood. You don't find these cells in the blood. They are residing in the tissue, normally formed in response to an insult, and they reside in the tissue that this insult uh, was uh, originated. Okay, how can the cells know where to go? Again, these are basic concepts of immunology but with the perspective of uh, mucosal immunology. This is a classical example. Uh, in, in fact, part of uh, my discovery uh, in the postdoc, but uh, in the gut you have a lot of uh, dietary metabolites, microbial metabolites. Vitamin A is one of them. Vitamin A is produced, of course, there's metabolite produced by the liver, but it's also produced in large amounts by the gut epithelium. So the cells that are in the gut are exposed to vitamin A in higher amounts. The dendritic cells that normally are living in the gut tissue, they are exposed to, the, to vitamin A, and part of this metabolite called retinoic acid uh, is mediating the instruction of the dendritic cell to the T cell. So if the, it's in the gut draining lymph nodes, the lymph nodes that drain the intestine. You have a lot of dendritic cells that come from the intestine, obviously, and they are producing retinoic acid. When retinoic acid uh, is, in, is produced and is sensed by the T cell, it upregulates integrins that are gut homing. So they will induce the T cell to migrate to the, to the gut. And these are examples, CCR9 and alpha alpha beta 7. So this factor that is present in the gut is what is telling the T cells to go back to the gut. Because the T cells don't go back naturally, right? They have to be activated in the lymph nodes, then migrate to the lymphatics, back to the right tissue. And this is a process that's very interesting to study. For example, in a skin, a different type of antigen-presenting cell will modulate the T cells to go back to the skin. And a different factor will be produced that will allow the cells to know that they should go to the skin. Uh, and the same is true in the lung and so on. Uh, in the gut, it's, this is one of them, is the retinoic acid. So that's how the T cells will know where to go once they get activated. I will stop for a minute here, but I will start giving some examples of how we studied that in the lab. But let's see, what time is it? 3.34. Maybe I don't go all the way, and we just uh, discuss, because we have 25 minutes, and then I can do this another day. Let's discuss what I just <laughs> presented. Okay, I will wait until someone asks a question. Uh, did anyone see any parallel to this in your own field, um, non-immunologists? Not my field, but I have um, 
a colleague that works with microbiota in sea turtles. In? In, in sea turtles. Uh -huh. And she's seeing the difference uh, uh, in the microbiome of sea turtles that have a disease and the healthy ones. Yeah, that's right. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting. Let's see if I can show this data. It's not here. Um, so, w I may have to find this slide, but um, let's see. Maybe I will take too much time to find. But basically, we have, um, we have a study that we found that uh, several of the enteric pathogens, uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter, and so on, they induce loss of neurons, enteric neurons, not brain neurons. Enteric, the gut has a lot of neurons. That's part of the area of the lab studies. Uh, and some of these pathogens, even though they are not neurotropic, they induce loss of neurons. Uh, and that's because of the inflammation that the pathogens uh, cause. What we found is that this loss of neurons is permanent. Uh, even though the gut neurons are able to regenerate. Okay. However, if you take these animals that are infected and give antibiotics and replenish to the microbiota they had pre-infection, the neurons come back. So the change in the microbiota induced by the infection is what is preventing the neurons to regenerate. So that's kind of a, a parallel to what you mentioned. So there's disease-associated microbiota and, you know, non-disease-associated microbiota. Easy to explain. More topics. Yes, I, I, so last week we talked about um, host pathogen interaction in plants. We had a, in? A, a, in plants. Ah, yes, so that's cloud. where disease tolerance yeah. came from. And, and one interesting thing, but this is a, a, an interesting thing that, that we were uh, shown uh, is that in plants usually, or uh, commonly, the microorganisms which are pathogens, is the, the, the microorganisms which uh, are beneficial to the plant yeah. are extremely closely related. I see. Uh, extremely closely related. It can yeah. be just the difference That's of right. having a plasmid totally. or, or not. Even and then suddenly, substrains. Yeah, substrains can, can yeah. differ in that sense. Um, how does this compare to the microbiota of, of animals or humans? And I, I guess more generally, I, uh, one thing I, I think I don't understand so well is, is what is the general, is there something that separates the kind of microbiota that is good for, for us and the kind of microbiota we, we don't tolerate very sharply? Or is this really very uh, loose, these bounds? So two questions, things? you know, one question is how, um, you know, if you have a parallel in plants in mammals or the microbiota and what distinguishes a bad microbiota. So um, I would say that probably the answer is kind of all of the above in a sense that there are, for example, uh, for particular disease processes in a tumor, a colorectal tumor, for example, you have some microbiota species that are known to be associated with uh, uh, reduced immunotherapy or increased relapse. So particularly species of microbiota that are, uh, this is called pathobiont, actually. They are commensals, and then in a given circumstance or context, they become pathogenic. For example, in a colorectal cancer, these bacteria are, are there in the lumen. They are not causing any problem. Colorectal cancer, you have disruption of the epithelial layer. This bacteria can gain access more easily than other bacteria, then cause disease, right? So it's the same bacteria that was commenced, so it became uh, pathogenic. Uh, I would say that uh, the field is not completely kind of settled in, for example, in obesity. Before, they used to have a parallel in obesity of specific classes of bacteria. I showed the names, actually, in the beginning, but it doesn't matter. Specific class of bacteria that are more common in lean people, others that are more con in common in obese people. But and then in the initial studies, they did some experiments that they transferred and they gained more weight. But that is unclear if it's that black and white. Uh, you may have 
bacteria species indeed that are because of the type of metabolism they are when you eat a particular thing they uh, will have an impact is a beautiful study from this guy from Israel called uh, Eran Elinav exactly on that he was describing how the same food for example ice cream from whatever uh, in the, uh, what's the name I forgot uh, gelato ice cream from gelato vanilla ice cream in different people will give a different result in the, in the in glycemic levels and a lot of that is because of the bacteria these people have uh, so for sure you have species that uh, will have an impact in a particular biological process that can be seen as pathogenic if having high levels of glucose it's bad for this person right so so yeah my answer was kind of saying that they're all examples of what you asked. Same strains, for example, C. difficile. Clostridium difficile is the most common, uh, kind of the most common bacterial infection in people in hospitals. And there are strains of Clostridium difficile, so the same species that are uh, producing a level of toxin, that uh, CTB, CTA, that are different than other strains in the same species. So anyway, so you have all the variations but plant uh, uh, kind of biology of microbiome is not very different than the one you have in mammals in, in soil you have is a different soil is different because you have a lot of this uh, uh, kind of balance between bacteriophages and bacteria I forgot the number of bacteriophages that are in the planet but it's something like 10 to the 33 it's crazy it's the most common form of life related to what you're answering Benjamin those studies that they make about the relations between the microbiota and the other things like the way you gain weight and you mm -hmm. put a lot of things there until like addiction that I was yeah. really interested those studies they usually are how they are made they are just correlations or they know the underlying yeah. mechanisms that yeah. allows the bacteria to change the way that our synapses yeah, work. Yeah, so or that's right. So the, how do you conclude yes, this, yes. right? So obviously, I guess, you know, the initial studies were all correlations. So when I was doing undergrad, they didn't know even that it was possible to sequence, you know, it was impossible to sequence uh, bacteria. So the initial studies in the field were all correlational, including the one I just mentioned, yeah. being from these, these are actually Martin Blazer from NYU. So when you have C. difficile, what people do, approve, um, you're in hospital. Oh, yeah? Ah, the bathroom. Someone is complaining? Oh, OK. OK. OK, when you have C. difficile, I think it's, yes. OK, so uh, when you have C, C. difficile infection, for example, uh, one of the treatments approved, and there was a little bit of a problem in the clinical trial, was what they call FMT, fecal microbiota transplant. It's a pill of people, of poo, poop from people, that you take uh, to restore your microbiota composition. Uh, correlational, right? Although you restore the normal levels, so what is the field uh, kind of direction? Is what you're asking, is uh, going from these correlations to mechanistic finding a species or a substrain that is doing that and then you control. A person that is doing that, the best I know is a, a Kenya Honda, Japanese uh, researcher from Keio University. So he's the one, he, he, he goes and he says, well, okay, Let's see how different, uh, he goes and take, collects poop from different people, colonize animals, and then how this, see how these animals respond to a particular insult. Uh, cancer, uh, immunotherapy, uh, you know, infection, or whatever. 
and then he looks at different combination of bacteria and then begins splitting. You know, I sequenced, you know, the difference between these people is 45 species. I, I split between, I then treat with antibiotic that depletes gram negative and then separates. And then, and then he finds five species that are protective against colorectal cancer, five that are pathogenic against an infection. So what are these species producing? Then he finds a metabolite. Uh, and th there are a series of papers that he published doing exactly that. It's not in the clinical Oh, it's in a clinical trial, but it's not, uh, we don't have drugs done from this type of strategy yet. But that's the direction. So just uh, the direction is just finding those metabolites that act on our brain? If it's a metabolite, yeah, There yes. are other mechanisms to... There are other mechanisms. Besides metabolites, there are modulation of host metabolites. There are induction of immune responses, right, via uh, the uh, particular characteristics of the, of the bacteria. There are multiple ways. For example, um, we produce short-chain fatty acids in response to uh, bacteria. So we need, a, well, we need bacteria in our distal intestine to produce short-chain fatty acids derived. So you have fibers and processing of fibers and, and lipids into short-chain fatty acids that can go to the brain, for example, and modulate uh, depression. So that's a way of, you know, short-chain fatty acids is a field so it's not only metabolites from bacteria, it's host-derived and so on. Thank you. Um, well, my question is more related to uh, allergic reactions. Yeah. Um, why does a person suddenly develop a, a reaction, an allergic reaction a, against a, to a food or some, for example? I mean, what happened into a cell in order to now you develop that? So we don't know the answer for that because okay. that's the main question on the field. Okay. It's exactly that. Of course, you have atopic people that are propensity, genetically propensed to allergy. And uh, people study these people, but not everyone allergic is atopic, right? Yes. So, and your question is exactly what the field doesn't know. <laughs> but uh, there are many ideas of how this developed. For mm -hmm. example, uh, Ruslam, so we have a grant, a uh, group of people that only discuss that. Uh, and Ruslam's uh, idea is that uh, what makes certain uh, food or components uh, more allergic prone, it's their composition. For example, uh, lipid content of nuts, Brazilian nuts or uh, other types of nuts, they, te they have uh, kind of type of lipids that they have that the lipid can work as adjuvant. Mm -hmm. So uh, it boosts the initiation of immune response against the uh, peanut uh, protein because of the type of lipids. And that's also true in pollen, also true in other. You have dozen of types of foods that are highly allergic, right? So the composition of these types of food is relevant. And what the idea, again, I'm not saying that's the correct idea or the only idea, but it's that if the allergic response were selected to deal with noxious substances, this is seen as noxious. Mm -hmm. It's more propensity to, for you to develop an allergic reaction type two, because that's how you deal with noxious substances. You develop Ig. I didn't have time to talk about Ig, another type of antibody that mediates the allergic reaction. But that's kind of the direction that. Uh, <coughs> but still, not everyone is allergic to peanut, right? So what makes some people develop suddenly. And it's very common. I mean, 80% of my Brazilian friends went to the US and developed uh, allergy to pollen. They didn't have allergy, although there's less pollen here, but uh, it's weird, right? My sister went to England and became allergic to banana, mm -hmm. but it's, uh, you know, it's weird. Banana transgenic, maybe, or whatever it is. But there are these examples that are difficult to, to explain. But it's very likely on the composition of the substance that you, not on the peptide itself, but on the, what is around, lipid, uh, whatever that is. But uh, it could be mm, considered like a damage in the immune system, or it's just like a reaction, or is still the, the question? So once the immune system sees a particular substance, as noxious mm -hmm. and developed an immune reaction to it. Mm -hmm. 
let's say, uh, peanut, and you are not allergic, but suddenly you ate peanut and it became, uh, you ha developed a reaction. Mm -hmm. That will develop two problems. One is you have a memory T cell mm -hmm. that every time you expose to the peanut, even if it's not in a dangerous or you know way, you will see as a as a, uh, something risky or that it will induce inflammation. And you have memory B cells as well, so you're going to have production of these Ig antibodies for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So every time you see, it can get worse, right? Okay. And that's very interesting because there's a study they did in Israel with uh, um, atopic kids from family with a peanut allergy. And what they found, and uh, this has been uh, then repeated in the US uh, in Mount Sinai, that instead of uh, av avoiding uh, peanut because they have a history of peanut allergy, they start giving peanut uh, as a peanut butter. Mm -hmm. Uh, in, in do increasing doses since these kids were young. And that uh, actually worked in protecting against allergy mm -hmm. because that's a form of tolerance that yeah. actually maybe tomorrow or I, I will cover. Okay. Oral tolerance. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, going back to the RGA <laughs> question. It's just that uh, I was thinking about the, because like, as far as I know, the, the anti-progentin cell can present every niche type of antigen that they could catch, right? They do not have this uh, very big specificity. And then based on that, so we could produce IgA for every niche type of micro or virus, and as you said, we could produce it to, to the SARS-CoV and it helped it then mm -hmm. to stay in our gut. Yeah. So I don't know, I think that maybe we are seeing this problem from the wrong side, from the wrong point of view, because maybe are not we that are like selecting the microbiome, but the microbiome uh, getting this, this advantage of the IgA are staying there, and then our our body tries to take some advantage of it. You know? Yeah. No. I mean, I, I don't think I don't think pe people studying IgA uh, are not claiming that uh, IgA is to control the microbiome. So what you're proposing is that this may be a way that the microbiome became symbiotic, for example, and that is possible. I, you know, the study I mentioned shows kind of that. The study I mentioned from Greg, uh, my postdoc. So I think it's, it's possible. What is important to point on your question is that uh, a cell to become IgA producer will be is similar to what I was showing here, actually. IgA, actually, vitamin A is part of what makes a B cell to switch to IgA. Uh, so the context of antigen presentation in the gut induces more likely an IgA response in the end than an IgG. And then the type of function that the IgG will have is different than IgA, and that is part of the downstream modulation or interaction with the microbiome. So, yeah, I, I would say I, I agree. But then the, the constant part of the, the antibody, like the function of it is not context dependent, right? If it's an IgA, it will be uh, and do the function of IgA independent of where it's binding of the... Microbiome. More or less. So, uh, one, once, so he's asking whether the FC component of the antibody is context dependent. It's, de it's a little bit context dependent in the sense that, for example, if an IgG is present in a place that you have a lot of activating FC gamma receptors, that will induce an inflammatory reaction. If it's present in an in a environment with a lot of uh, FC gamma inhibitory, uh, R2B, then Sorry, that got, got very, very specific. But for example, uh, the antibodies that people take for SARS-CoV-2, in, in Brazil it's not common, but antibodies that you take. The isotype is very important because it can induce blockage, uh, helping the blocking uh, of the virus, or can induce an in inhibition of the immune response. And that is determined by the FC uh, component, FC gamma, uh, what kind of FC gamma receptor they will bind, and then each place in the body that this is produced will have different composition, right? 
In the case of IJ, that's even more complicated because IJ is secreted as a dimeric. So this bound is bound via the FC, meaning that the FC alpha receptor is almost no function because also in the gut you have almost no, uh, in the luminal side you almost have no, there's no cells, right? It's basically bacteria interacting with bacteria and so on. So that is even more, and I don't think they have FC alpha receptor in the epithelial cell. So the IgA FC mediated function is not very well described, but also may not have a lot of function. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, I, have the, I have the microphone. Okay. I can repeat. Oh. Yes, I just would like to point something about the previous topic regarding the exposition to antigens. And in my research group, once a professor who worked decades with snake venus suffered an uh, avenomatial case in the field. And we observed that in few moments, like minutes, he showed a strong immune response. He got very bad. His skin was terrible. And the doctors pointed out that this happened because of the exposition by uh, these, these ears working with yeah. the, the crude venom that wasn't uh, expected for a, a person by his age. And we saw that this immune response can do the prolonged exposure, can be really badly to a person, and sometimes can also lead to, to death. So. It's really yeah, that's sort of, uh, um, for example, allergic. Res I was answering to you, right? The allergic response. So you're never allergic in the first exposure, right? You you have to be exposed in a way that will induce Ig in the case of allergy. Ig will induce memory B cells and plasma cells that will continue secreting Ig or can turn into plasma cells in the re-exposure. But the Ig that's circulating is then bound into mast cells. Mast cells have FC epsilon, you know, alpha, gamma, FC epsilon receptor. And FC epsilon receptor, upon binding of the antigen in the second exposure, for example, the venom, will instantly, instantaneously uh, degranulate the mast cells. And large amount of mast cell degranulation, histamine, serotonin release, that leads to this so that, and then you may get worse because then you have more memory and so on. So, but that's similar to the process that we described. Okay, so until tomorrow.